Welcome back. I only have a short video this week. It's a follow-up on the topics we covered last week where we have two channels and creating custom indicator from those. It was a lengthy video last week, longer than I wanted to normally be. Uh, and I think that these topics that I'm going to cover today should have been included, but it was getting a little too long. I hope you're finding these useful. If you are, then please leave a like and remember to subscribe and then you'll be notified as new videos arrive. Thank you. First, I want to review the impact of using the public statement in inheritance here and the private, protected and public scopes that we've been using in the classes. I've written a script that will help to demonstrate that. To begin with, I have a simple class. I've created a class C parent and inside that I have a private, a protected and a public method. Uh, each of these are just returning the function signature. This is a standard MQL4 macro. Then I've created a child class that has public inheritance from the parent class. It has just one public method, child public. And then in the script, I'm creating an object of type C parent and an object of type C child by calling new C parent or new C child. And then in this case, I'm testing by printing out the methods from parent calling the private, protected and public methods. As I've said here in the comments, the private and the protected methods will fail in the compiler. So let's just compile this and see. Now if I zoom here, you can see that cannot access private member function and cannot access protected member function. So the script cannot access private or protected methods in an object that it has created. Moving to the next stage, I still have the same C parent class. Child is still inheriting from that. All I've changed is that I have removed the two statements that were in error before, and I've now added in calls to the child public method using the child object and the parent public method using the child object. And all of these will work if I run through the compiler. No errors. So it's possible to call a public method of a parent class directly through the child class. Next, I'm still leaving the parent class untouched. My script is the same. I'm calling parent public, child public, and parent public through the child object. But I've now added a method inside the child class where I'm directly calling the parent, private, protected, and public methods. If I compile that, and zoom in on the results. You'll see that as expected, I can't call the private method of the parent class, but I can call the protected method from within the child class. Now remembering that earlier I could not call the protected method from the script. So while I can't call a protected method of an object that I create, I can call protected methods of parent classes from within a class. Just to prove that a little further, I've made one more change where I'm now creating an object of type parent inside this test function. So although child is inheriting from parent, I'm now also using an object of type parent. And when I compile this, these two methods will fail. But this will succeed. So the child class is able to directly call protected methods of the parent, but cannot call them through an object created inside the class. Let me just compile and zoom into the results. We can see that parent protected cannot access protected member function. The difference is between calling inherited methods and once I create an instance of the parent class, these are no longer inherited methods. I've made a number of changes now. Firstly, I've changed the inheritance on the child class from public to protected. I've updated the test function to remove the lines that were problems. And I've added a further subclass that has public inheritance from the child class. And in that, I just have one public method and a test method where I'm calling the protected parent, 
public parent and the public method of the child class. Then in my script, I'm creating an object of type C sub with the new C sub method. I'm printing the parent public function, the child public function from the child object, parent public from the child object, which we've done before. And now I'm adding calls to the sub public method, the child public method, and the parent public method, all from the subclass. And as I've indicated, I should get errors on calling the parent public method from the child and calling the parent public method from the subclass. Let me compile that. And zoom in, and just as I said, C parent, parent public, cannot access, protected member function now. And parent public, cannot access, protected member function. Now remember that before, this child.parent public method was successful in the compiler. But now because I've changed the inheritance model from public to protected, this has become invisible to my script. And the last thing to show here, I've now made the inheritance private by removing protected from this class child statement. And if I compile this now, as also indicated here in the comments, both of these methods will fail where they previously succeeded. Let me compile that. If I zoom in here, So, C parent, parent public, cannot access private member function. Because this is the subclass, it's inheriting through the child class, but has no further visibility of the parent methods because the inheritance from the parent to the child class is now private. Next I want to look at the impact of this virtual statement on functions. This is something else that we touched on at the last video. So what I've created here is a parent class that has two functions, function 1 and function 2, both returning a string, again using this functsig method or functsig macro from MQL4. Function 2 is virtual, function 1 is not. Then I have a child class with public inheritance from the parent. It also has two functions, function 1 and function 2 both again referring the functsig macro. In the script I'm creating a parent object of type C parent by calling new C parent. I'm creating a child object of type C child by calling new C child. But then I'm creating a second parent object also of type C parent but by calling the constructor on the child class. Then I'm going to call function 1 three times, once by calling from the parent, then by calling function 1 from the child, and then by calling function 1 from the second parent. Then I'm going to do the same thing but using function 2 to show the difference in which functions will actually be executed depending on whether the function is virtual or not virtual. So I'll compile that and then I'll run it. Now if we go here and I will zoom in on the results of the script. Functions loaded successfully, initialized. Initially we called function 1 from the parent and the result was the C parent function 1 as expected. We called function 1 from the child and again, as expected, the result was C child function 1. But then we called parent 2 function 1. And again, we got C parent function 1. So in this case, although I created parent 2 by calling new C child, it called the function inside the parent class. Function 2, however, is a virtual function. 
and calling parent.function2 is a direct call to that function and as expected we get C parent function 2. Calling function 2 of the child of course gets C child function 2. But then when I called parent 2 dot function 2 it actually ran C child function 2. And this is where virtual functions are used to override functions. Let me switch back to the code. I mentioned this in the last video. By creating a virtual function in the parent method, the child function is able to override that. And then at runtime, we will execute the lowest level function that overrides the virtual functions. The last thing I want to address today is also something hungover from last week. I said that the ATR channel would typically take five arguments, but I only used one. And I just want to clear up that although this inherits from channel base, just as the Donchian channel, I can actually have more arguments to this. Uh, and I'm going to do that now. So first thing we need to do is update the constructor. Now this is the new constructor that I'll be using. Uh, I've just put it in beside the old constructor so that you can see what I've added. So up to the ATR periods are the same, but now I'm adding the extra four arguments. The ATR multiplier giving us the width of the channel. MA periods showing how we're calculating the moving average that is the midpoint of the channel. Uh, the MA method and the price applied for moving average calculations. I also need to update the init method to add in the new arguments. Same thing here, multiplier, periods, method and price. We'll remove that method. Here in the call to default values I obviously have more arguments now to pass to the init method. So I'll change this. And in this case my defaults are still as they were before but I'm actually passing them to the init method. Now in the constructor function, I've obviously added more arguments here and I need to pass more into the init method. So the new method will look like this, additional arguments and a change to the init call. Then in the init method here, where I was previously just setting default values for these, I'm going to pass them in as arguments. I also need to make one change here in the calculation of update values because I had previously been using the same number of periods for both the mid-channel calculation for the MA and for the ATR. So I'm just going to shift this line around a little. And I'm going to recalculate the limit Firstly, based on the MA periods. Here is the indicator that we had previously. Now obviously I'm going to need more inputs if I'm going to pass extra arguments into the ATR channel. So here are the extra inputs that I need. A double for the ATR multiplier, int for the MA periods, and the enums for MA method and applied price. I'm unable to hide these if you select channel type Donchian in the input screen. So I also like to add something that indicates that these particular values are only going to be used if you've selected the ATR channel. So I'll add one more line to the input. Again, it's an input, but this value is never going to be used and I just use it to put a label in the input screen that indicates these parameters for the ATR channel. Once I've done that, I'll just put in a line here to show the difference. All I need to do now is to create the ATR channel 
passing in the additional arguments. So this is where we demonstrate that although both of these are defined, here we are, uh, they're both defined as type channel base, they have different constructors and I'm able to call them differently. So now I have the indicator loaded twice, the same inputs. So they're sitting on top of each other and we can see the blue lines. Let me first modify by changing the multiplier. So I'll just change the width of the channel. Now the blue lines have moved further out from the center. And let's move the center line by changing moving average periods. And now we have a completely different channel for the blue lines. So that was just to indicate that we're not tied down to having the same inputs and constructors for classes that inherit from the same base class. And that's all that I wanted to follow up on what we've done so far in terms of creating indicators and custom indicators for the charts. Um, next week, I want to move on to something different uh, because we're moving towards creating an expert advisor. There are a couple of things I want to do first. And I've also had many requests to create dashboards. Now, I haven't been given any specific request as to the information in the dashboards, so I'm just going to demonstrate how I typically create dashboards in terms of the presentation, and then I can leave it to you to decide which information you want to put into those. Uh, until then, thank you for watching. I hope this has been useful. Stay safe.